Linguistics is a science, and sciences have theories. But some theories are really bad, like worse than my upload schedule bad. So that begs the question, what are some bad and downright crazy linguistic theories? Here are three of them. Number zero. Okay, I know I just said that there were going to be three theories, but this slot is about Nostratic, Borean, Altaic, and the other somewhat sane attempts to genetically link languages into macrofamilies. Almost every single credible linguist states that the Altaic macrofamily is false from a genetic perspective, but it holds true as a Sprachbund relationship, that the Nostratic family is a bunch of codswallop, and that Borean, <laughs> it's a good joke. The thing with this long-range comparative linguistics is that there is both a legitimate attempt to connect language families, which we've successfully done at least once, the Dene and Asean language family is a macrofamily, and that there's probably some truth to these theories, just the way that the puzzle pieces fit together is what we don't know. We know which people groups were where in history, how the migrations out of Africa took place, and the genetic relationship between ethnicities in different language families, and how that genetic pool has been changed over time. So, whereas I think theories like Altaic, Nostratic, and Borean are wrong, I do think that there's merit in that these theories conform to demographic history and give a good attempt at linking languages, and honestly, I think they're right in some places, we just can't prove which ones. They aren't the crazy reconstructions. Let's talk about Sigurd Vettenhovi Aspa. I'm really glad I did that Swedish livestream, because my source for this is in Swedish. Sigurd was a Finnish bit of everything guy, including a pseudo-linguist. He believed that the original language of the world was Proto-Finnish. This sounds insane, but remember, when Sigurd was active in linguistics during the late 1800s and early 1900s, the view that Hebrew was the original world language was still extremely common, and of course, we know today that Hebrew is not the proto-world. Sigurd's theory was that the Finns originated in Indonesia, went through India, formed the basis of ancient Egyptian civilization, before spreading throughout all of Europe and forming all the cultures of Europe today. He knew that Finnish was distinct from the Indo-European languages, and his theory was that the Finns simply settled all of Europe first. Sigurd's evidence was taking the words and place names from his path of Finnish migration and showing how they were sonically like Finnish phrases, which is definitely an amazing scientific method. Sigurd died in 1946, never letting go of his wildly insane theories and the imagination of a child, given as he was also a supporter of Hitler. Now, let's talk about dolphins. As a Bills fan, I'm obligated to say that the dolphins suck. And anyway, I think sharks are cooler. I digress. In the 1960s, a man named John Lilly, funded by NASA, became fascinated by the brain size of the dolphin, and was convinced that he could train dolphins how to produce human speech noises, and that they could comprehend and reproduce English. LSD was involved. The experiment is one of the most infamous in history, just because of how horribly it ultimately went. Margaret Lovat, the researcher literally living with a dolphin named Peter, would spend all day above a pool teaching Peter to reproduce phonemes and doing work from a suspended desk. The theory proved to be false. Dolphins cannot reproduce phonemes, nor can they understand English, although it was found that Peter could reproduce supersegmentals such as tone and stress. That's as far as I'm going to go with this, as do be warned, if you look further into this experiment, it is terribly dark. Some honorable mentions are that the Algonquin languages are descended from Old Norse, that Egyptian hieroglyphics were concepts regarding the truth of the universe, and hard sapir whorf, the original version of linguistic relativity. Now, I would like to give special thanks to my Patreon supporters, who pretty much keep this channel going and are really awesome. Thanks to Albert Jones, Benny, Agma Schwa, Opfuscopel, Pirate, Eden, Acorn, Cactus Creek, Stein G, and Ayu. If you feel so inclined, consider supporting me on Patreon, or subscribing if you haven't already. Let's get to the last crazy linguistic theory. This is Ido Nyland. Nyland? Nyland? One of the two. I'm going to go with Nyland. Nyland's very much like Sigurd Aspa in that he formed a unique take on proto-world and the evolution of language, but he wasn't doing it to promote ethno-nationalism. I think he's just a quack. He idolizes Chomsky, after all. There's not much information that I could find about him. I haven't found whether he's even alive still, but this forum post claims that he has a bachelor's degree in forestry and that his dive into linguistics was based on his fascination of the Odyssey. So what does Nyland's research amount to? I genuinely feel like this could be the plot of a Monty Python movie. 
I and some Big Lang buddies are going to read some excerpts from Nyland's website and from the overview of his book, because I cannot sufficiently summarize this. It's that amazing. Welcome, like in the Fictioneer. Edo Nyland shares with us his research on the evolution of European and other languages, and his conclusions offer fresh perspectives that challenge traditional views entertained by the linguistic establishment. Nyland's research was inspired by a CBC presentation by the historian Edward Furlong, who suggested that Odysseus may not at all have been travelling in the Mediterranean, but rather in Scotland and Ireland, where the climate and topography fit far better with the descriptions found in the Odyssey. Nyland set off on an odyssey of his own, visiting the proposed locations, and while he found much to support Furlong's thesis, he felt more evidence was needed to confirm it. He began by examining place names mentioned in the Odyssey, and he began to wonder if they might be telling a story. But from what language were they derived? Greek, Latin and Gaelic dictionaries were no help. He discovered a clue in the work of geneticist Luigi Cavalli Sforza, who had suggested that there might be early migrations of the peoples living along the Atlantic coast, from Morocco to Scotland and Ireland, and even Arctic Norway. Of these, only the Basques still spoke their original Neolithic language, and in choosing a Basque dictionary to translate coastal place names, Nyland found that they did indeed yield remarkably fitting descriptions. In visiting Bronze Age ruins, Nyland came on the Ogham inscriptions carved into the Standing Stones of Ireland. These had not yet been deciphered, but Nyland began to suspect they might encode elements of the Basque language. After applying his method successfully to such languages as Spanish, German, Sanskrit, and Sumerian, Nyland concludes that Basque is the core language from which so many more were derived. All right. Basque is a pre-Indo-European language, that's true, but toponym analysis isn't the greatest. But most glaringly, how could everything be descended from Basque if Basque is so clearly an isolate? How can Basque be the mother language if nothing else is like it? Welcome to the real fun part. Let's read from Nyland's website. Welcome, Babalingua. In the following series of articles, I will show how the ancient Saharan language was used by linguists to invent all the Indo-European and Semitic languages, including Sanskrit, Greek, Latin, German, Hebrew, Yiddish, etc. This was done with the use of different formulaic manipulations of the Saharan vocabulary, creating totally invented non-genetic language families. In Genesis 11.1, 1, this language is said to be spoken in the whole world, and even though this statement is not quite correct, it may be called the universal language, which had been the language of the first civilization on Earth, located in North Africa in the Near East. It is still spoken in unmanipulated but over time altered form by the Dravidians of India, the Basques of Uthskadi, and the Ainu of Japan. In Genesis 11.7, we are told, Come, let us confuse their language, that they may no longer understand one another's speech. The clergy of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam consider this a holy command and spent an enormous and long-sustained effort to bring about this confusion. The formula used by them in most of the artificially constructed vocabularies is called the vowel interlocking, or VCV formula. Because the Basque language is the closest to the ancient Saharan language, it has the best English dictionary, I will call this language Basque from now on. In most cases, the first two, three, or four letters of each Basque word were agglutinated into a new word. After this was done, some or many of the vowels and H's were removed according to a plan to give the new word special characteristics. In Hebrew most, if not all of the vowels were removed from the writing, but not for speaking. Examples being, Talmud was spelled LMD, but pronounced Talmud, from Basque Tala, Mudapen, watch out. Alternation, watch out for alternation, which is basic to an oral law. Okay, that was a lot. So, Nyland lists the following hypotheses. And now, welcome Agma Schwa. Hypothesis 1. The Saharan language was the language of the peoples living in the Sahara during the last Ice Age, who created the first true civilization on Earth, possibly centered around Lake Chad. 
As a result of deglaciation starting around 18,000 years before the present, or BP, resulting in ever-expanding desertification, these tribes were forced to flee for their lives, creating an exodus culminating between 9,000 and 5,500 BP. Those refugees created four main secondary civilizations in Mesopotamia, Egypt, the Indus Valley, and Anatolia. Hypothesis 2. The Saharan language is still spoken as Dravidian in India, with 170 million speakers, as Ainu on the island of Hokkaido with 18,000 speakers, and as Basque in Euskadi, Spain with 800,000 speakers. Basque is likely the closest resembling the original language of the Exodus. Hypothesis 3. The people of the Exodus from the Sahara brought with them a matrilinearly organized society, a nature-based goddess religion, and the first highly developed language maintained by very strong oral traditions. Hypothesis 4. As a result of several major advances in a number of fields such as agriculture, metallurgy, the domestication of the horse and camel, astronomy, etc., the female-based religion was weakened and male domination arrived circa 5000 BP in Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Anatolia, and about 3500 BP in India. These newcomers brought along learned priesthoods who proceeded to invert all aspects of the old religion, society, and language. A new language was invented for each large area and placed under the control of a king. For example, the Sumerians and Akkadians in Mesopotamia, Old Egyptian in Egypt, Samskirtska in Hindi in India, Hebrew in Palestine, Hittite in Luvian in Anatolia, etc. All these were the product of a formulaic and scholarly manipulation of the original Saharan language. The Bible repeats this command to distort the original language in Genesis 11.7. In Hypothesis 5, these newly created languages were then introduced to the local population by taking young boys into residential schools and forcing the new order onto them, where they were often brutally treated. The purpose of this was to destroy the old religion and language and the traditional oral teaching of wisdom, religion, and legends, replacing it with a patriarchal vision of the world and civilization. They almost succeeded. The hidden sentences in the invented words can be decoded with the use of a Basque dictionary and a simple formula. All highly developed languages on Earth, except for possibly Chinese, have been shown to be developed from the original Saharan language, which in itself was also scholarly enhanced from the Neolithic substratum. There exists no family of Indo-European or Semitic languages. There are no Indo-Europeans or a Proto-Indo-European language. All these unstable languages are invented by scholars. The Saharan has only remained relatively unchanged and is now spoken as Basque. As ancient astronaut theories contend. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, we need to go over how every single European language except Basque is a conling invented by fascist Orthodox monks. Welcome, Connor Quimby. Oh, hey, that's me. Yeah, this is just from Nylon's website, by the way. I feel like I should mention that. It's linked in the description and in the cards, so, you know, check it out if you want a good chuckle. The monk linguists used a large number of tricks to make the languages they created sound very different. First, the paraphrastic word order of Basque was completely reversed, which created a fundamental difference and became the main characteristic of the Indo-European family of languages. For English, the pronunciation of the alphabet was changed from the usual Latin to the English sound, which instantly caused the words to be pronounced very differently. Uh, I think he's talking about how we kind of nasalize and aspirate everything, but I have no idea. Okay, back to what he's saying. Relatively few vowels were removed from the Latin agglutinations, but many more from the English ones, giving it a very different feel. Most languages receive newly invented characteristic letters, such as O with a hat, U with two dots, slash EO, O with two dots, N E, etc., and or unusual combinations of letters such as O in French pronounced O, or the Dutch I pronounced something like OI, but can only be said properly by a Dutchman. No doubt intended as a joke, Dutch also ended up with the embarrassing deep throat scrape written as G or CH, such as in, oh, now you get to hear my Dutch, Schäfenigen, Schap, Chan, I am so sorry, Acorn, and to all the other Dutch people who watch my channel. I am so sorry.
That was embarrassing. Nylon's right. That was extremely embarrassing. A sound which the monks probably borrowed from Hebrew and tossed it into Dutch. Thank goodness the Benedictines resisted these peculiar urges when they created English, which therefore became the simplest of all to learn and speak, and eventually became England's most successful export in spite of its often ridiculous pronunciation. To some languages, the monks assigned a sex for each word, example in French and German, which led to dumb cases such as the soldier on guard duty who is female, die Schildwache in German, and La Sentinelle in French. Holland is one of the few countries, Holland is not a country, Nayland, which rid itself in this century of this incredible sex nuisance. Retaining today only the neutral form het, example, the horse, is not de pod, but het pod. Uh, again, American. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I try. I really do try. I should probably try harder, but I still try. Back to Nyland. Grammatical rules for each language were invented. Some more appropriate and more easy to use than others, but only German ended up with endless and ungainly lists of Ausnahmen, exceptions to the ungainly grammatical rules. I don't think Nyland's heard of the Slavic languages. However, none of these languages was saddled with grammatical rules as complicated as the Basque grammar possesses, although Latin came close. In English, the original verbs were separated by, example, the two at the end of zerbitu, to serve, which became tu zerbi, as b became v, tu servi, and to serve in English, tu dienen in Dutch, and zu dienen in German. In English, the original i was maintained in the word service, broken down into serbi ike, serbi ikilari, serve the visitor. English is full of such Benedictine tricks. Other examples which show that the two at the end of the Basque verbs became the two before the English verb, begitu, to look, apurtu, to break, destroy, kasitu, to whitewash, neuriratu, to regulate, etc. From my working with the following languages, it appears that all highly developed languages, without exception, were invented by linguists. Some languages turned out to be more elegant and useful than others. If this is indeed the case, then we should be entitled to start facing out some of the unnecessary and dying ones, such as Celtic, Frisian, Wallonian, Flemish, Catalan, etc. Danish and Norwegian are almost the same, so why not combine them, as the Basques did with their seven languages, which are now together called Euskara Batua, or Unified Basque. Ukrainian and Russian, Galician and Portuguese, Finnish and Estonian, Polish and Kashubian, Czech and Slovak, Macedonian and Bulgarian, etc., all can be combined with a bit of goodwill. Why treasure something as artificial and unauthentic as the many unnecessary and people-dividing Benedictine language creations with which we are now stuck with? I've had a sudden realization that all of this has to be satire. It's too funny not to be satire. It's so out there. It's so insane. It's such a crazy linguistic theory. I think we've been played for fools. This, this isn't a crazy linguistic theory. This is art. This is satirization of Nostratic and Borean. This is satirization of comparative linguistics and guessing what the history was and presenting it as an academic thing. Ido Nyland, I take back what I said about him being a quack. He's an artistic genius. I am beyond impressed. And I think accordingly, it's time to end this video. So thanks to Lycan the Fictioneer for helping me out in the research part of this video. To him, Babalingua, and Agmashwa for lending me their beautiful voices. And once again to my Patreon supporters. Thanks for watching. Connor out. That video only took one year to make.